Okay, uh, here's the lecture, just a PowerPoint lecture, uh, on Langston Hughes. And Langston Hughes is one of America's greatest writers. Uh, he has a wide following. He was popular in his lifetime. And he's kind of uh, one of America's greatest, I think, writers. Uh, he always writes from a black point of view, but his black point of view was accessible to many people, and people would really understand what he had to say and how he said it. Uh, I think his work always has a very uh, positive tone to it, which is very important. So here he says, hold fast to dreams, for if dreams die, life is a broken winged bird that cannot fly. This is one of his poems and captures this sense of hopefulness that uh, the idea of literature is to be hopeful, uh, to give people hope, as well as to be critical and a little bit angry. Um, and I think the uh, story, uh, Thank You, Ma'am, is a little bit angry and a little bit hopeful, both. So what I want to do in this lecture is to uh, give you some idea that about how to read a short story more deeply. And we can think about many aspects of the story. So before uh, you listen to this lecture, if you didn't read the story yet, read it now and read it again. Short, short story won't take you long. Second, think about the story. Third, read the questions about the story. Fourth, reread the story with the questions, going slowly, thinking, and taking notes, right? First time you read, you should read quickly. Second time, deeply. And then, after you look at the questions and think about it, go slow. Lastly, set the story aside and think outside the story, and then you'll have even more ideas to talk about. So let's move ahead. <coughs> if we think about the idea of a story, we can divide it into pieces. This is a little hard to see, but uh, it's there on Manaba, so you can check this out. Um, these questions help us to understand what the story is. The story is like a human body. It's made up of different systems. The human body is made up of blood, of muscles, of bones, of digestion, of nerves, right? And a story is kind of alive, too. That's why it's more interesting than typical textbook. Literature, literary language, and literary form uh, uses different systems to become more alive. A short story uses character, symbols, setting, conflicts, irony, and theme. There's other elements as well, but these are the main ones, and you have to really grab these in order to get deeper into the short story. So that's what we want to look today, is to look at these different parts of the story. People, objects, places, problems, things that we don't expect, and themes is the big ideas. That's what we really want to look at here, okay? So all of these things, character connects to theme, symbols connects to theme, setting connects to theme, conflicts connects to theme, irony connects to theme. Everything is really connected in a short story, and especially a great short story like this one. So let's jump ahead and we're going to look at symbols first. So if you haven't thought about the symbols, just look back at the story for a minute and try to find all the things that are in the story, okay? The symbols in this story are many. A symbol is anything, action, or object that carries meaning. It's a metaphor, right? This story, I think, has lots of great symbols about themes, about ideas, right? 
Uh, first of all, uh, she has a large purse, a large pocketbook, right? Uh, so Mrs. Luella Bates Washington Jones has lots of experience, right? Uh, you know the feeling of carrying a heavy bag. Now, in it, she said, in it, he says she has everything except hammer and nails, meaning everything is in her purse except this has a long strap, and it broke when he grabs it. Now, this tells us something about her already. The purse is not just a purse. It's her experience, her life uh, understanding, and she's able to put all of that and carry it with her. Now, if you're a good thief, you probably wouldn't want to pick this kind of huge bag. Maybe you think there's something in there, but what you really want is the money, right? So we'll get back to that later. She grabs him by the shirt front. He's sweating. She puts him in a half Nelson. Half Nelson is holding him tightly. And she grabs him and says, you're not going to get away from me. I'm stronger than you are, right? Uh, she shakes him, she kicks him in the butt, and she is not afraid of him. Instead of being afraid of him, it's just the opposite. She sees his dirty face. When she gets up close, she knows there's something not quite right with this kid, right? If his face is dirty, he's poor. That's the bottom line. Takes him home, switches on the light. Light is symbolic. She turns the light on in the kid's head. She leaves the door open, symbol of choice. He could run or not run. She tells him to go to the sink, gives him warm water, a clean towel, right? The water is purifying him, washing off the dirt. Just like when you go to a temple, you wash your hands in the temple before you go inside. And he needs to clean up from the street before he starts to eat. She makes supper and asks him about the money, blue suede shoes, which are at that time expensive shoes. But really, she's trying to get him to clean up, clean himself and to use the comb, right? The gas plate and the ice box are symbols of what she has, heat and cool. Milk, very symbolic. Milk is what mothers give their children. And that's what she's giving him is a kind of milk. He's too old, of course, to get milk from her breast, but he's not too old for milk, and he needs to be taken care of. Not only milk, but cocoa, that's a chocolate milk, right? So a little bit of irony, we can guess they're not white people, they're probably black people. Lima beans and ham, common, common meal. But then she gives him cake, too, right? And the most shocking thing is she really gives him $10, right? She says, okay, you want blue suede shoes? Here's your $10. You do what you want. And after that, she shuts the door and he's gone. And all of these symbols come together. That starts from outside, goes inside, and each one of those has some meaning. The blue suede shoes is what we desire, but lima beans and ham is what he needs. This is what he wants, blue suede shoes, but milk is what he needs, and that's what he gets. The settings are very important in this story, and the setting of any story uh, usually carries lots of meaning, right? Uh, if we have a conversation in the bedroom, it's different from a conversation outside. And the settings carry meaning just like symbols do. The story starts in the street, moves to a room, and ends on the street, right? They 
bump into each other, 11 o'clock at night. This is a public space. There's two or three people there, but not many. The kitchenette furnished room means she's not poor, but not rich either, right? Furnished room means the she doesn't own the furniture. It's at the rear of the house, cheaper place, and there's other rumors there, right? He goes to the middle of the room where he has to make a decision. Is he going to run back to the street or is he going to stay there? And I think he stays there after he washes because what he really wants is a meal, not the blue suede shoes. He's lonely. He needs somebody to be with. And he tells her there's nobody at his house. Right? Her kitchen is small. It's a kitchenette that's like half a kitchen. And she also talks about the beauty shop where she works. That's another setting. Okay? And the setting there, we don't really hear about it, but it's important because it shows she has a life outside of her room. The story ends at the door on the barren stoop and the boy goes back out into the street. It's even later at night, right? She's working till 11 o'clock at night. That's late, right? And she sends the boy out even later. There's a couple of missing settings in this story. One of them is Roger's home. We don't hear anything about it other than there's nobody at his house. And the other missing setting is jail, because really she could have taken him to jail or called a policeman, but she doesn't. She takes him home, right? And we'll get to that when we look at irony. A story also has uh, characters, right? Conflicts in the story are many, and we have to look at a co the conflicts of the story is really one of the important parts of the story. With no conflicts, the story is boring. So Roger has many conflicts in his life, right? Many problems. He has no family, nobody to look after him, nobody to tell him right from wrong, nobody to tell him to wash his face. Well, he's committed a crime, but we start to feel a little sorry for him. He's lived on the street, obviously, 11 o'clock at night. He's 14 or 15. That's a bit late, right? So he's trying to take care of himself. Life on the streets is a conflict. It's tough. It's violent. He has to choose between blue suede shoes and dinner in the end, he gets both, plus the cake, plus the uh, cocoa milk, plus a meal, right? So this is what he wants. This is what he desires, the shoes. But what he really needs is dinner and attention. Desire versus need. And we have to think, too, maybe he wants to get caught, right? He doesn't know how to use the money. He, he wants to use the money to buy blue suede shoes when he doesn't eat. And what about at the end of the story? What's he going to do with that money? Is he going to waste it, or is he going to use it for something important? Mrs. Luella Bates Washington Jones, all of her conflicts are in the past. But because of the conflicts, we have to guess what her conflicts were. We can think that now she is working and she understands things. She says, I have done things too, which I would not tell you nor tell God. Those must have been bad things, right? What did she do? We don't know, but something bad, right? But from that bad stuff, she's learned something. And she's able to become a better person because of her conflicts. 
And even more than that, she's able to help him with his conflict. So it's not just that she understands herself, she understands this boy. The external conflicts, the internal conflicts, right? Inside the boy and outside, make him choose and decide, and then has to make a change. And I don't think she changes. She doesn't need to change. But he needs to change, and she helps him change. That's conflict, choice and decision, resolution. All stories, all short stories have that. There's a problem, there's opposing forces, and then there's a change, an understanding. This story is very ironic, and I think it's a beautiful story because it's so ironic. Uh, first of all, uh, she doesn't do what she should, right? Um, she should take him to the police, but she doesn't. She does something else altogether. She takes him home. And we don't react the same way as her. We would call the police. I would grab him and say, you're going to the police, kid. But she doesn't do that. She teaches the boy, but she teaches us, too. She does something better. What would happen to the boy if he goes to the police? The police are going to help him? No, nah, they're just going to punish him, right? Jail doesn't help people, it punishes people. And maybe she's a little lonely. She says, if you were my son, and then she calls him that, right? She says, son. Now, that's a common way to call people in America. We would say, hey, man, hey, son, hey, boy. We would say those commonly. But in a story, this has double meaning. She treats him as well as a son. She treats him as if he were her son. She understands him, and her experience, I think, gives her this idea from the Bible, which is, judge not lest ye be judged. That means don't judge other people because they can judge you. And you're not supposed to judge other people. Only God can judge other people. And that's what she says. She says, I'm not going to judge you. I'm not going to tell you you're a bad boy. He said, I would teach you what's right and what's wrong, but I'm not going to judge you. And that's an irony, because most of us, at the beginning of the story, think, wow, that's a bad kid. But by the end of the story, we think something different. We think, that's sad, that kid. That's too bad for that kid. Man, I wouldn't want to grow up without parents, without dinner, living on the street. I wouldn't want that for anybody. Another irony is Roger doesn't get what he wants. He gets what he needs, right? He wants the shoes, but he gets attention, and he gets money. The money that he gets from her is different than the money he tries to steal. The money she gives him has a different meaning, right? Money isn't just money. Money means something. Think about the money you have. If you work a part-time job and you're paid 1,000 yen an hour, you know exactly what that money means. You had to clean up or work at Starbucks or suffer you know, tutoring some kid. And the money in this story changes from the beginning to the end, right? The money becomes meaningful. And that's an irony. Money isn't just money. She truly forgives him. She turns the other cheek. And it's ironic because most people can't. He has to see his victim and her life. He attacks her. She should be the victim, but she's not. She becomes the stronger person. She becomes the person in charge. And all of these things are irony because it's different from what we expect to happen. Now, 
those ironies, those conflicts, those things are all connected to the themes. And I think there's many more themes than this. But here's a few themes that I think are important. How do we react to people? Do we punish them or do we teach him? She kicked his ass, right, and shook him. But she also gave this idea of shame. Aren't you ashamed of yourself? And she teaches him how to be a better person, how to live better, how to be better. And she says, if you buy if you buy shoes with money you stole, it will burn your feet, right? And she's right, because, you know, the money that you steal is different from money that you earn, right? Another theme is how do we treat people? She says, I got a great mind to wash her face for you. I would teach you right from wrong if you were my son. So she's an example, really, of kindness, of sharing. She gives him half of her 10 cent cake. She's an example of forgiving. And, you know, it's easy to hate people. It's easy to be angry at people. It's easy to get revenge and to punish people. But to forgive them, that's hard. And this story is really about forgiving. The story also is about the loneliness of city life. At the beginning, she was walking alone, and he has nobody at home. So both of them are alone. And if you look in the story, she starts to call him son, 72, line 90, line 94. And then at the very end of the story, she pushes him outside, and he's again a boy. We know his name, Roger. She asks it. She calls him son. Roger, but then at the end, he's back to being just a boy. And the loneliness, the sense of being distant from people is really a part of this story. How do we use and think of money, right? All of the money in the story is from her. Stolen money, earned money, money that you know the value of. She gives him food not because she's rich. She gives him food because she knows what it means to be poor. And she gives him the money with a lesson. She pays him. Normally, you pay for a lesson. But in this case, she gives him the lesson first, and then she pays him. So he'll remember that. In other words, she rehumanizes him. She saves him from being a robber and instead turns him back into a human being. Prison would dehumanize him, right? Take away the best human qualities. And, of course, I think this story is a criticism of how young people are treated. Uh, people who commit crimes when they're young, yes, it's a bad thing. But are they really bad people? I guess not. And so the story makes us rethink about being rehumanized. Here's the writing. This is for extra credit. Uh, write your opinion about this story. What did it teach you? What did it make you understand? Choose one of the elements symbols, settings, character, conflict, or irony, and write about that one element in your opinion. What are the other themes of this story? I gave you a short list, but what's the other themes? Which theme is the most interesting for you? Try to write on all three of those questions if you can. This is your idea. This is your analysis. This is thinking broadly. Have fun. Write a lot. Make it interesting.